All right. Uh, so first, who here is from Vermont? Nice. Who is going to hot dog hysteria tomorrow? 25 cent hot dogs, baseball game. Really? Oh, man. OK. So, <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Did you see that? Oh. Nice. Yeah, no, that's perfect. Okay, I'll Thank leave you. for that for this one. <laughs> uh, okay, I can still see you because I got one more question. But before you raise your hand for this, I'm curious as to who would be interested in continuing Pi Data meetups on a monthly basis. And what that means is we get together once a month, we get some food, we get some drinks, and we figure out what we want to do as a community together. So it could be something like five minute lightning talks uh, where you get to talk about what project you're working on. It could be uh, longer talks where people are talking about you know, their, their company or their PhD, things like that. So uh, it's really a community-oriented event, and we would want to shape it based on what we want it to be. So who would be interested in continuing this type of thing? All right, here, I want to see a lot of phones come up now, because please fill out this form. <laughs> uh, and specifically, uh, participation, yes, is would be amazing. We also really need help organizing, as Kendall was saying uh, this morning when we were kicking this off. Uh, and anyone who does have some free time, the more people that can pitch in, the easier it will be to get these things going on a monthly basis, uh, where maybe not every organizer needs to be at every one, because we understand we all have busy schedules. OK, so that said, uh, that will be up there for the rest of the talk. And there's uh, one more QR code coming up that will also stay up there uh, until we get to some demos, which will go beautifully. Uh, don't worry about it. Uh, so I am here from NumFocus. I am with the Open Source Science Initiative, which is a program uh, that stands at the intersection of open source and open science. And I want to invite you to help solve a problem uh, in open source and open science that we're working on. And this visual is uh, a very early version of uh, the solution to this problem. And when we think about this problem, it probably helps to put ourselves in the shoes of some of the key stakeholders in this space. So let's think of ourselves for a second as someone who doesn't, might not have access to traditional hubs of knowledge, someone who doesn't have access to an academic institution, a mentorship program, or long-standing communities in open source. But they're a curious person, and they want to learn about something, and they want to use open source software and maybe some data sets to, to learn about that thing, let's say solar astronomy. Do we think that we, as this person, would be able to find the open source tools that we could use to start exploring the sun? And if we do magically find SunPy or AstroPy, would we be able to see what other tools are often used complementary to those tools? Would we, would we be able to find the data sets which we would use these tools to analyze? Would we be able to find the communities that could help us enter the open source world, learn how to use GitHub, uh, learn how to make an issue, learn how to make a pull request, and eventually, hopefully, become like a long-standing contributor to open source, a maintainer, maybe make a project of our own? Would we be able to do that if we don't have access to academic institutions, to Verso, to, to these mentorship programs and these communities that we all take for granted? I think I'm confidently saying no. I don't think we can do that as someone outside of our world. Uh, another key stakeholder, let's put ourselves in the shoes of these academic institutions who we ask so much of as the open source community. We ask them to, to support the people within their institutions that create open source software, particularly for research. We ask them to keep track of what projects come out of their institutions, how they're used, and what domain they're used in. Are they used solely in their institution? Are they used solely for one research project and then kind of die? Are they used by a consortium of institutions? Are they used by an entire domain, by thousands of people, or by 12 very passionate people in a very niche field of research who find this, this package, this library, critical? Uh, if we're this institution, could we do any of this? Could we track that? Could we determine who from our institution is actually creating software, what those projects are, where those projects are being used, and, and how impactful they are? Another key stakeholder, so I'm, I'm going to say I don't think institutions can do that right now. Uh, another key stakeholder in this space, funders. Uh, funders are critical, and we're asking a lot of them right now. We're begging for more money in open source, because we all understand that open source is critical. We need to find ways to sustain it and to maintain it and to accelerate its growth to make it more uh, ubiquitous in the, in the world. Uh, yet, we, we don't fully appreciate, perhaps, that funders don't live in our world, 
they don't understand open source and this ecosystem the way we do. Uh, and they need vast amounts of information to make informed decisions about where to put money to best advance their goals. So could they do that right now? If you're a funder, could you honestly say that you can find the open source projects that are used in a domain that you're interested in, something like Synbio? Could you find uh, the, the projects that are kind of duplicating efforts because you don't want to fund project B because you just funded project A and project B is kind of doing the same features and, and functions as project A, but you might want to fund a collaboration between the two teams. You might want to fund a consolidation so there's not, uh, so there's less noise in the space, fewer duplicated projects, fewer, ab uh, less abandoned wear, less professor wear, uh, less one-off projects. Could you find the core dependencies to the fields in which you're interested in? The dependencies that if they didn't exist, you wouldn't really be able to do anything and they're desperately in need of funding. Uh, could you safely say what projects are healthy and stable and capable of accepting funds? Which projects have simply a point of contact, a maintainer that shows up every day, checks their issues, triages those issues, determines which ones are critical, and then starts addressing the critical issues right away, the security risks, those sort of things, versus what projects don't have that, which projects are abandoned. Uh, funder does not want to fund, does not want to support a project that's abandoned, even if they're using it. And then perhaps most importantly, could you say that you could measure your impact of your funding? Could you predict what a dollar will do if you give it to a project? That's what funders need to do. They need to be able to predict what a dollar is going to do, then measure what a dollar actually does, then compare the results with what they predicted so they can modify their predictive algorithm uh, and, and change it for future rounds. And then the last stakeholder that I think is really important is us. And when we think about who we are as participants in this system, we could go to every open source conference, every open source event in the world, and we'd probably meet one to 5% of the community of the network. And I think that's, that's just a random guess, by the way, but I think it's a way, way over a guess. I think we would meet much, many fewer, much fewer number of people. Uh, and that's, that's not great. We need to be able to see who in the ecosystem is working on what, no matter where they are. These events are amazing, fantastic. There need to be more of them, but they're exclusive by nature. So we need to see who's working in Japan on open source, who's working in India on open source, who's doing what where, what funders are funding what in what way, what organizations are, what, uh, are supporting what actions and to what level, what people are new to the space and need help, what people have been here for a long time and are very wise, what people are builders, who are maintainers, who are users, uh, and, and we need to be able to identify the problems in this space. So what are the, the shared problems we're all experiencing? Who's working to solve those problems? How are they working to solve those problems? What are the solutions they're working on? Are those solutions working in a lab? Uh, if, are, are they being adopted? If they're being adopted, are they working in the real world? And how well are they working in the real world if they're there? So those are the four sort of core users that exemplify the problem of just, we don't know what exists in open source and open science. We don't understand how it's all interrelated. And what's really neat uh, is when we think of, when we solve for these users, is we end up solving for many other use cases. I think we're, we've counted in our work up to uh, 11 use cases that people have identified for us based on uh, what we're building, which is a map of the open source science and uh, source open source software space. Uh, and as we collect data points, as we determine why we're collecting data points and, and how we're determining how things are related, uh, we find people share how they would like to use this map with us. And we're going to be having some of those discussions at the SIOS workshop tomorrow, so do come back and come to that workshop uh, so we can explore more data and how to get it into this type of map. Uh, and what's also very neat about solving for these four use cases is we end up creating some additive benefits to the space. For example, when we make a roadmap for people to enter the space, to find tools and data sets, uh, we, yeah, we're going to grow the space and we'll all use the map, but it's not built for us. It's built for people who don't have access to this, uh, this facility or the institutions or the mentorship programs. So we're going to be bringing other people with different backgrounds and different experiences and, and different ways, uh, different knowledge bases and traditions of doing and learning. And that makes open source as a network and as an ecosystem more robust and more sustainable. When we solve for the problems of the academic institutions, being able to identify who's building what and what their tools are being used for, uh, 
ideally, we can make sort of a friendly competition, a leaderboard of institutions uh, who are competing to build the best software that is most sustainable and used by researchers across a wide array of domains. When we solve for the problems of funders trying to measure impact and determine where to put funding and how to, how to best support open source, which they know is very important, uh, yeah, we're gonna hopefully change buckets of money into boatloads of money, but the way that funding is allocated might actually change. Maybe instead of funding one-off projects, we end up funding core systems with satellite projects around them. And in standing up that type of, type of system, there's a contract between a satellite and a core where a satellite understands that it doesn't necessarily need to be sustainable. It just needs to appreciate that there is a sunset protocol for when it does sunset, its features and functions that are critical get absorbed into the core system. Uh, and are still there, even though the project might not be. And then funders don't need to understand the entire ecosystem, they just need to understand several dozen cores. Give money to the cores, who then determine how to give money to their satellites. We could also be able to track, with a map like this, the, the way communities create ripple effects throughout the ecosystem, so that funders can fund communities directly and not try to fumble through various organizations as they, as they currently do. But we could also see what these organizations uh, how these organizations impact the, the space, similar to how communities do. These organizations and organizers who are critically important, people who put on stuff like this and the Pi Data events around the world and so many other great open source events. They're, we need more of these and funders need to be able to see what the impact of them and the ripple effects through the ecosystem. And uh, most exciting to me, we might be able to see the, the nexus people, the pillar people of this, of this network, the people who are at the intersection of many subsystems within open source, who when you just give them money to do what they do, they make great things happen in this ecosystem. And then lastly, when we solve for the problems of us, of the community, being able to self-reflect, being able to see what we do, what we're really doing is giving data that's traditionally captured and held uh, by large organizations and large institutions because they're capable of doing it, but we're giving that data to ourselves. And when we have that data, we get to build the tools that we get to use. Uh, so that feels a little weird, but what it might look like is something like uh, uh, open impact algorithms. So what is an open impact algorithm? Well, I've said the term impact many times already. Impact is incredibly subjective. A good day today is gonna be completely different than a good day for me tomorrow. The definition of an impactful project I have today might be a dependency graph. The more projects that depend on my project, the more impactful my project is. Tomorrow, it might be a citation graph. The more papers that cite my project, the more impactful my paper is, or my project is. And the day after that, it might be based on how many core developers wear blue shoes. And that's absolutely fine. It's a definition of impact. We should be able to exist. The point is we need to be able to build them. And when we have the uh, data in front of us in some type of map, we would be able to build these and, and interact with them however we want based on uh, our use case at the time. So what we're really building is an open source Google Maps of open source and open science. Because when we think about what Google Maps is, it's an extension of that paper map that we had in the car, glove compartment. You take it out, you'd unfold it, You'd have to find where you are in the map, first of all. Then you'd have to find where you want to go, trace the route, identify the road signs and the road names, which coincidentally, there are not a lot of road signs in Burlington, which I find incredibly frustrating. But <laughs> you would then have to hope that you don't pass your turn, because if you did, you'd then have to find yourself on the map again and retrace how to get to where you get to go. And you'd also have to hope you have a co-pilot to do all this for you so you don't crash along the way. From those paper maps, we digitized that process to MapQuest, where we would, it would trace the line for us, give us the directions, give us the exact distance between steps, and print it out and give it to us. It was still the same paper map, just a little, little easier. Then what Google Maps is, is it digitalized the whole process where they created a database of mapping information and then created multiple interfaces with that same database. And I can choose what my definition of impact is, and uh, toggle the map however I want. So maybe I do want to get from point A to point B. Uh, what's interesting with Google Maps is it will change based on uh, sort of things that happen while I'm driving. So if there's a car accident or a speed trap or uh, construction, a security risk, it will still get me from A to B. It'll reroute me around the security risk. I can also toggle different layers like avoid tolls, avoid, avoid ferries, which is also very important in Burlington. Uh, 
and it will still get me from point A to point B based on that definition of impact now. I can also say I want to go from A to B to C to D. Between C and D, I need a gas station. Between A and B, I need a Shake Shack. And it'll do that just fine. And then I can ignore that use case in completely, ignore directions on Google Maps, and just toggle the satellite layer and explore the world. And my definition of impact when I'm just exploring Google Maps as a satellite layer is whether or not I can see the tree, whether or not I can see the bike path, completely different than directions. And keeping that satellite layer toggled, I can use a completely, or interact with it and have a completely different definition of impact. I might need to uh, determine the perimeter of my property so I can figure out how much fencing to buy. So I toggle the uh, distance tool and measure the distance uh, around my, my property by the fence. Same data set, original data set. Three different use cases, three different uh, definitions of impact. That's what we need for open source, and that's what we're building. An open source Google Maps for open source and open science. So uh, join us in building this thing. Us is myself and a gentleman named Mark Iyer. So there's two of us. Uh, and we are part of a interest group that is over 100 members from 40 plus institutions, companies, organizations uh, who meet monthly, discuss the problems, discuss how to get the data, all the things we'll be discussing at the workshops tomorrow, we discuss on a monthly basis virtually. Uh, and, and let's see if we can't make this thing work. So now I'll show you where this picture came from. Uh, Oh, and I didn't go through this, but these are the three core problems, by the way. I figured I should write them down so you all could see them. Uh, how can we show what tools are being used in what domain? How can we give academic institutions the ability to showcase what tools are coming out of their institutions? How can we give funders the ability essentially to track impact? And how can we give the community the ability to be self-aware? So we'll go through each of those four use cases, and we'll start with UVM uh, and show who is building what and where those tools are being used. So, like I said, live demos, but everything is going to be fine. There we go. It's the University of Vermont. So this is a subset of the bigger map. We just got this working maybe three days ago. So uh, it's not integrated with the full version of Moss. Uh, I'll show you what the full version looks like in just a second. And I say full because we're adding hundreds of thousands of nodes as we speak. Uh, all right, so I'm going to turn names off. That's a little noisy. And I'm going to show people. So here is the University of Vermont ecosystem. No relationships toggled. Uh, and here are, well, it says there's relationships toggled, but they're not. There we go. Uh, and then here are the relationships that uh, we've built out so far for UVM. Uh, so if we put the peoples and the projects to the academic institution, they'll all go to UVM. Uh, and then if I hit. Thank you. And then if we go uh, projects to domains, and this is the only one I'm going to tackle because this is a uh, memory hog and I'm on a wee little laptop. But we can see that UVM contributes, and the people at UVM contributes to open source software, largely in these two domains. <laughs> So we can still see it, yeah? OK. So we've got social sciences and physical sciences seem to be the biggest domains that UVM focuses on. Uh, these smaller ones, uh, I'm not going to try and zoom in on, but I think it's like life sciences, et cetera. And then as we get into the fields, thank you. Uh, we, we get more granular, and we can go fields, subfields, topics, and topics are incredibly granular. They would break every computer that we try to run this on. We'd need an instance to do it. So this is just the UVM subset. We've got UT Austin's data ready for us to go right now, and we can do this. It's a script we can run. We're going to put it on GitHub very soon, uh, and we can do every institution, and we will do every institution. And then once we get them connected, we're going to get to see that leaderboard. It's going to be really fun to see what happens out of that. Uh, okay, so here is the uh, more complete map. Let's say this is 50,000 nodes with 70,000 relationships. Um, and I'll toggle as much as I can. We're looking at time here. Oh, we got plenty. We'll just sit here and watch dots appear on the screen for a while. So this is largely based on the NumFocus ecosystem. Uh, these are all the people. Uh, that are in, a, in, I think, three degrees of separation, because we just started adding papers. 
uh, and papers that cite projects and authors of those papers, and then uh, the institutions to which those authors are affiliated. So I think that's three degrees. I don't know. There you go. So there's packages. And I'll stop adding dots at this point. But you can see it's a lot of data. It's a lot of data points. It's a lot of people, packages, projects. Uh, some other things we want to map, patents and products and economic output. Uh, this is not on here, but it is a fun aside uh, because we've got time. Imagine if you're able to track, uh, you, you start with uh, open source software that's used to create foundational research. That foundational research is picked up by industry that uses it to translate, make translation uh, of it. That translation turns into a patent, which turns into a product, which then makes money. Just being able to see what software is critical to making money would uh, be the dream, I think, of this space, because we could then bring that to funders and say, this is why open source is important. It's used to make toothpaste. But it, there, there might be automated processes where we can actually trickle funding from that, the, the income that's coming in from selling that product all the way back down that pipeline to the people who created that software in the first place. That would be really, really fun. OK, so I'll stop putting dots on this, uh, but I will show this one, which is the same map, just fully rendered. Uh, I've also never seen this big. It's, it's fun. It's really fun to, to play with this thing. Uh, so uh, this is not necessarily how we expect people to use what we're building. It's like if you were using Google Maps and you turned on absolutely everything, that would be kind of, you know, it would be fun, but practically useless. Uh, but it's, like I'm saying, it's fun to look at, and it does show like maybe some of the different renderings. Uh, so these are the different, let's see if it'll load with all these dots on the screen. I'm going to have to go back to this one to show that. So these are the different relationships that we've mapped so far. Uh, there's many of them. Uh, and there's some of, some of these we've deprecated and some are not listed here. We've added more since, since uh, this version was put out. Uh, but again, what types of relationships would be useful to you? Come to the workshop tomorrow. This is what we're going to be discussing. Uh, hey, it loaded. And now it's in the way. <laughs> so, OK, I'll start over here. This is the NumFocus ecosystem. Um, this orange dot, if you can see it, is NumFocus as an organization. Uh, the green dots are people. And then all the like these little things, these are different projects in NumFocus. So these are people tied to those projects. And then this white dot is the data science domain. NumFocus largely focuses on data science projects. Uh, that's why that's the biggest domain. And so all the projects are connected to that data science domain. There's the use case for bringing people into this space, showing them what software to use for what specific thing. We also have some data sets in here that are connected to various domains and uh, fields, et cetera. Uh, the yellow lines are complementary relationships, tools that are often used together, cited together in papers. Uh, the blues are uh, dependency graphing. So this circle down here is bioconductor, which is very interconnected. On, it's dependent on itself, which is really interesting. Uh, and then you can see, uh, you can't really see them, but there is a lot of uh, dependency graphing going on in the NumFocus ecosystem. And this big, uh, in the spirit of Verso Octopus, uh, is Scikit-Learn. Right at the middle is one project, Scikit-Learn. And then one degree away from it is uh, papers that cite Scikit-Learn. And then two degrees away from it are paper, or people that wrote those papers that cite Scikit-Learn. And then another degree away from it are the institutions to which those people are affiliated. And we've done this with multiple projects now, and it's hundreds and hundreds and millions of nodes. And we have this in a data set. We're trying to figure out how to visualize it, because it's, it's a lot of points. And this tool called Kumu is not capable of visualizing that many nodes. This is about as much as Kumu can do, which, by the way, if you're just trying to visualize some data, use Kumu. Uh, up to 50,000 nodes, let's say, it is very, very good. It's no code. You just plug in your data set, and you get the, to do some really fun stuff. Uh, but we are now evolving beyond Kumu, and we're going to move to some Neo4j and React. Uh, I'm, yeah, 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 this is where we're going. And we're going to restart this. Also, if you're curious about how we're collecting all this data and, and all that fun stuff, 
Uh, I think I'll have time for questions, but we'll also be talking about that at the workshops tomorrow. Uh, okay, so we've got this running. Hey, all right, so this is that same Kumu map, that same full rendering, and we're now in 3D, and uh, we're, we talk about bringing this into some sort of VR platform every day, because that would be so fun. Uh, but here is that scikit-learn sphere, uh, connected to some other stuff. I honestly don't fully remember what is on this map. I think this is the NumFocus ecosystem over here, some of it, uh, but you can zoom in and, and just like, this, this is getting very fun, right? Oh yeah, okay. Uh, now, I, that, that's largely um, what I've got. I've got one more database. This is gonna take a second to spin up. Um, so I will highlight, I guess, this is called SDGs, right? When we talk to people about what we're building, what data we collect, why we collect it, how people would use it, uh, and how we collect it, I think that's a, a lot of the stuff at least, uh, people say, oh my gosh, I wanna use it for this, I wanna use it for that. Uh, and most of the time it's like, yeah, that's a really good idea, let's figure out how to do it. Uh, one instance of that happening, and we'll be talking about that if I haven't mentioned already at the workshops tomorrow, uh, so come join us for that. Uh, but someone said, hey, I think we should figure out what software is important for advancing the UN 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And man, what a good idea. So we looked into whether or not that's possible, and it is entirely possible. And demos aside, we did it. So we'll <laughs> see if this could come up in a second. Um, and while this is loading, I will bring up this QR code once again, because it is truly two of us doing a lot of the legwork here, uh, and we would love more help. Uh, it's a great community. You do get to tie in directly with NumFocus, and NumFocus is a lovely community itself. Uh, the Open Source Science Initiative is uh, researchers, open source maintainers, uh, and contributors all getting together to talk about what tools we're building and how we're using them, and how we can uh, build better tools of more use. Did anyone see if, uh, hey, it's active. Okay, so let's see these SDGs. Is everyone familiar, is anyone not familiar with the SDGs? The UN's, oh man, okay. Well, this is a great introduction to them. Uh, the UN has 17 sustainable development goals that they try to advance. Uh, there are things like end of poverty, end poverty, end starvation, uh, gender equality, uh, sustain life on land, life below water, that sort of stuff. So we've mapped three of them, uh, simply because there's a lot of information here. Uh, and I'm using a trackpad to navigate this, which is not the easiest. Woo. So we've got one here. I think this says gender equality. The green notes are papers that are important to advancing that SDG. And then the blue things are projects that have been cited by these papers. So these edge papers with just a set of three SDGs seem to be important to just this one SDG. But then these other ones, which I think are life on land and life below water, uh, you can see is the intersections. <laughs> there we go. Okay, we start to see some pretty critical projects emerge. Uh, and it's really hard to see, but these projects seem to be important to advancing multiple of these goals at once. So if I'm the UN or if I'm a funder who agrees with this, these SDGs, I might look for those projects that are the nexus points of these subsystems and look to fund those. I might look for the people that contribute to these projects and look to support them. The organizations that are the fiscal sponsors to some of these projects or support some of these projects, run events around these projects and support them, fund them. You can see hopefully how uh, this type of data set that can be, have multiple interactions built on top of it can start to become valuable in many different ways depending on, where, on what your definition of impact is when you start using it. And the end state of this, we hope, besides having simply an omniscient layer of all the data to open source and open science, is a natural language interface where uh, you 
can query the map. You ask the map, hey, here's my definition of impact. What should I fund? And it will tell you. So with that said, I'll stop here. And I think we get to go to lunch. So thanks. <laughs>